Hmm. Oh, hey y'all. I'm having a bit of an issue today. See, I was trying to watch, like, one of my favorite films. The Big Lebowski, because, like, when I do commentary and, like, rewatch my video, I like to have something going on the side that I can take a break from, and, you know me, I'm the all into that nostalgia and stuff, and, uh, the warm tape sounds or whatever. And, um, for some reason, this tape just won't play. Like, it'll play, but the head is spinning, like, really slow, and it won't track, and then it doesn't want to eject. I'm trying to see if, like, maybe there's a spring. It might be, or, like, not really sure. I mean, you'd think after this many years, you know, 30 years of life, 15 or more of them spent messing with VCRs and watching movies on VCRs that I would have an idea of how to figure this out, but it's still a mystery to me how you get video and sound out of a piece of tape. Like, I get it. Yeah, I know how it works. Like, the head's slanted and it reads and it's got trackers on the tape and everything and it transfers that data, like, analog. But, like, I understand digital way better than I do this. But I don't know. Like, okay, here. Let, let's just... You, you come see. Come see. Alright, here we go. So, tape, tape, tape's going in. And I can see the tape is like a bit crinkled there. Oh, well. And what the heck. Now, it, now it's playing. But it's not tracking very well, so. Maybe it's just a fluke. Huh. Okay, well, let's eject it and see if it is a fluke. Okay, it stops. Ah! What the hell? Alright, hang on. Okay, now I'm just upset. So you're telling me that, like, this whole... I mean, could it be, like, the 20-year-old blockbuster tape? I don't know. To play is human. To rewind is divine. Alright, so, hang on. To make sure it's not just the VCR. It could be the tape. It might have just been the tape, honestly. I mean, it could have just... You know, been kind of crinkled up or something, been off track just a little, and every time the head went to like read it, it couldn't. Uh, but uh, just to make sure, we'll go ahead and throw in one of my other favorite movies and and see if that's the case. So, uh, come on, let's let's see. Tapes going in. I don't know. But what I do know is, now I just want to sit here and watch Jurassic Park all day and not do any commentary. Uh, but anyways, whatever, let's get on to the video. So I was at the hobby store a couple months ago and I seen this M41 Walker Bulldog and I was like, oh sweet, look at that Vietnam era tank. I like I would love to build that. I've never actually like put a model kit together, you know. And so I took it home and I was like, oh cool, I'm gonna put this together and like I'm gonna try to be like super nice and fine with it and like leave no glue residue or anything anywhere. And I'll start with the turret because it looks like the coolest piece of equipment on the entire model and you know and and I should have known better you know I should have known that I wasn't just going to put this simple model kit together and it be a tank all on its own uh, I had I had other plans for it I thought I oh, well I could easily turn this into like a giant gun on like a walking mech or something like that but to challenge myself I'll stick to the amount of detail that's already in this model and I'll use as many pieces from the kit that I can along with some scratch bashing and a little bit of trash bashing 
to make a mech. It's like, oh yeah, that'll work, great. And honestly, I mean, look at the amount of precise, tiny little details in this turret alone. There's no way this will be like a super big job or take a lot of time. And unfortunately it was. And my first challenge was figuring out how to mount this onto the body. And the second challenge offside to that was the body itself. And I figured I would use the bottom part of the tank and cut it in half and stand it vertical and I would build off that. That would at least give me a base and I could go from there. Now I'm definitely no stranger to cheap Chinese plastic and some of the best Chinese plastic is these little bubbles right here. They usually come with a slime hand in them or some kind of fake toy or earring or something like that that gets lost on the way home. Regardless, they make for really good cockpits or domes or see-through glass or anything that you would need round. And I've used it for, as a cockpit before on my Junker spaceship, so I figured, well, why not? You know, it kind of fits the aesthetic of my world. But I figured we'd glue this to the body and we'd move on to maybe sticking a pilot in there. Now, I don't have any fancy resin printer or anything like that. I just have an old cheap FDM printer. But, at super fine quality, printing it about 25 minutes... It produced this little guy, which I got as a free download off of Colts 3D. Now his posture's not right and he's packing some heat, but I figured with a little bit of modification and some super glue, this might actually go a long way. And considering the fact that it'd be inside the cockpit, you wouldn't really have to worry about too many of the details anyways. And putting a lot of work into tiny little details that won't ever be seen again is literally the highlight of this entire video. Pretty much the whole build, honestly. And with a little bit of grooming and trying to delete some of these layer lines, it actually turned out pretty okay. All that we need to do is find the correct position to put him in and build him a little seat. And I couldn't really find the right bits of trash to throw in here to make a seat, so I figured, hey, it's the perfect time to pull out some of that good old styrene. Now if you've not heard of styrene, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. It's one of the most all-round building materials out there, especially when it comes to model makers. And you can fuse it together with some weld bond. Of course, I've heard some crafters say that. But over here, we like to use good old-fashioned 99 cent super glue. And with a little bit of baking soda and a whole lot of super glue, a good bond can go a long way on a thin piece of styrene. We'll add a little bit of paneling in the back of the cockpit and throw on some wires underneath to get some form of illusion like this is some kind of analog control platform. A couple little detail pieces from the model kit itself. And let us not forget this display control panel which I completely forgot to film. Oh, and also this little digital display that nobody's ever going to see again. And wow, we have something that looks like something. Isn't it incredible? For the legs, I figured I'd use this piece of Tonka truck crane that my son doesn't play with anymore. I mean, what do we do with the old toys that our kids don't play with anymore? Do we throw them away and suffocate plankton and all our friends down at Bikini Bottom when it ends up in the ocean? Or do we turn it into model kits and pieces of grown-up Lego bits that we can stick together with glue and make into something else? Personally, I feel like my own type of super dad when I upcycle old toys. Instead of giving it to Goodwill, in which some other kid might find some joy out of it, that'd just be insane. I braided some armature wire and then used my hand drill to drill holes through the legs so that I could give it a little bit of rigid structure and that it could stand up on its own. This also was the easiest way to get the two bits of legs to go together without trying to find some horrible piece of plastic that wouldn't hold up in the long run. Then I pulled out some scrap wood and broke out the drill press and then placed this monstrosity on its toes. Then I used my custom milled hammer 
to beat the armature wire flat on the bottom of the base so that it would stay in place. And ain't this hammer just nifty? I, I had this made, like requested from a blacksmith. How cool is that? I mean, it's just like perfect in every way, shape, and form. And it's made out of a railroad spike. How neat. I just love craftsmanship. Now another big challenge for me with this build was how to mount the turret to the body. And out of a billion different ways that you could probably come up with to mount this, I opted to elevate it above the body because I thought a shoulder mounted turret would be pretty freaking cool. I used this tiny little bulb thing that I don't remember where it came from and glued some wires on it to carry that auxiliary cable look onward throughout the build. And note to self, when trying to reinforce hot glue bonds with super glue, wait until the hot glue is dried completely and cooled down because it releases some kind of toxic gas that burns your eyeballs. I learned that the hard way like every time and somehow still forget. And as I mount the turret, you're going to notice some wires and some weird bits coming off the end of the barrel. And that's because I tried to put one of those little LED filaments in it out of like an LED light bulb. But I completely failed because I don't think the voltage was right for the LED filament that I had. So I opted to just throw in a tiny little LED in the cockpit and then some later on, which you'll see in just a minute. Now I've been saving these two little vape containers for a very long time and actually I've used one previously in a build where I made terrain for the same world you know it was the RSG one it was the little control gate thingy um, not really sure what you would call that I guess I could google it but uh, that would take time away from doing this and definitely don't want to do that but anyways you know we're just looking for shapes people that's pretty much all we're doing and you know with a little bit of sawing and some sanding you can make anything look like anything and then you attach some of these things that people curl their hair with and all of a sudden you have something that looks industrial I figured I'd take all these bits and bobs that you see before you and I attach them all together in some kind of form or fashion to make some details for the inside of the engine which was a complete waste of time because you don't see them and you'll never see them only I will see them but they're there anyways for what I like to call hidden content or maybe easter eggs I mean I guess you could call this an easter egg because it's hidden within the thing you know that's an easter egg right? Regardless, it's a lot of fun to put these tiny little details and these pieces together and then you add them to something bigger. You do that enough times and then you eventually have something that creates a grand scale. Or maybe that's not the right word. I I'm not sure what the word is that I'm looking for, but it it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, adding a bunch of details to things is gonna give it some sort of scale. And the smaller the things you add to it, the larger your scale is gonna look. I'm going to pack some tinfoil into the bottom of these things so that my LEDs reflect a little bit better and it gives them more life. And then I'm going to use these little bits of styrene to act as vents on the side. After all, you know what they say about art. It's all about the form. Or is that dancing? I don't know. I can't keep up with it anymore. All these modern day terms and all these sophisticated scientific things. I just, I'm just going to give up. Anyways, a little bit of testing of my LEDs to make sure I didn't completely mess it up somewhere. Oh wow, the circuit actually works. And they don't look too bad either. I actually hijacked these out of those little tea candle lights that you can get at like the dollar store with the little coin batteries in the bottom of them. They're really cheap. Makes for good flickering effects too if you need them for like lamps or fire or whatever. Then we'll stick it in place and move on to the arm.
For the arm, I really wanted to make an appendage with some bendage. So I opted to go the beadbot route. Now I'm pretty sure there's some English guy across the pond that made this kind of famous. And does it a lot better than me. And if you honestly need a tutorial, go check him out. His name is Bill making stuff for something like that. But a lot of crafters have done this so far. They kind of adopted it. And uh, it's a really easy way to make robot parts. And uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. Just some armature wire and then slide your beads on. And then a little bit of super glue to keep it in place. And then you can use all kinds of bits and bobs and dangly things to dress it up and make it look like not beads, which is kind of the whole goal in the first place. And it's really a cheap solution to making like bots too. Like you can buy like a whole pack of beads at the dollar store for like a buck or even less sometimes. And you can find like granny's mason jars full of buttons and bits and bobs uh, all day at the yard sale or you know Goodwill or whatever. Uh, those th some some reason, but like a bunch of mammals like to collect beads and buttons. I don't know. M m my mama does it, so yeah, that's kind of where I get that reference from. Now I truly love all the details that they put into this model. I mean honestly it's insane how detailed this thing is. And with Greedleys after we put all the armor plating on, that's what we're going to aspire to do. I cut a ping pong ball in half and used some spray foam to adhere this to his, the bottom of his legs to act as his boots. And then I used two halves of that easter egg I was talking about earlier to make the top half of the boot. I used some cheap paper straws that I picked up at the dollar store and some stirring straws to add some details inside the leg that you'd never see again. And then I used some EVA foam and some small wires to make a belt to cover that gap between the torso to kind of transition to the waistline a little bit better. This is where you can kind of go nuts with Greeblies. You can use almost anything you can find and make it into something that you want to look at or you want to see, you have to really use your imagination and pick out a whole bunch of trash out of the garbage that just has interesting shapes. The tiny bits are always fun to find. I used some two millimeter EVA foam to make some armor plating, cover up these naked noodles he calls legs. And EVA foam is really cheap. You can find it at like every dollar store around the world. It comes in all different colors and sizes. It's really fun to work with. You can score it, mar it, scorch it, burn it. You can melt it. You can take a little tool like I have here, a little clay tool, and you can score into it. Or you can cut it and you can heat it up with a blow dryer or heat gun and it'll actually open the cells up a little bit more and make that more defined detail. But I use my clay sculpting tool to make different panel lines and then I use the needle point on it to make tiny little rivets to kind of go with the little rivets that were on the model kit. Now I'll be it, adding this much detail to this thing and trying to match the detail that was on the kit is a little bit painstaking and agonizing, but it actually gives me time to indulge in my creative thoughts and look at things in different perspectives, kind of like their scale and the detail that just random things have in them in general. Like for the bottom of the waistline, I wanted to make like a blast plate catch flack and other things from hitting sensitive components on the mech. And so I used a little bit of EVA foam and this cheap poker chip that I have and I cut it in half and with just a little bit more detailing it actually came out looking really nice. I used a bit more EVA foam and did the back side and it almost came out just like a little samurai -ish, like a little a little Japanese, but I really liked it. I wasn't trying to go for that aesthetic, but it's just kind of what we came across in the happening of it. Now, 
Now originally these pegs were meant for putting the wheels and the tracks in the tank, uh, but I had a better idea. With a little bit of help from some styrene and some bits out of my bit box, that I could probably assemble myself a decent looking rocket pack. I used the same paper straws I was talking about earlier and cut those to a portional size. And these black bits are the caps off those cheap super glue containers I get from the dollar store. I've kept them around for a long time hoping to use them for something. I filled that tube with hot glue and then stuck a bigger tube over top of it and then used these little orange cap thingies that I can't remember where they came from and put them on the back to act as like some kind of radial blast cap or something like that. I repeated that a few more times. Then I adhered them to my piece of styrene and then used a couple matchsticks to separate the salvos. Once I got all the missiles in place, I then wrapped some EVA foam around the edge of it to act as some straps to hold them in place, then I attached them to the main body of the mech. Now my mom all gave me a whole bag of these thread spoils, so I took one and I decided to use it. So I added a couple of those cheap poker chips to the side of it and attached it to the back of the mech to cover this big old gap, but also act as a fuel tank. Then I moved on to detailing the arm. I used some more of that EVA foam and my clay sculpting tool to add some details and plated it all the way up his arm. I added a few more bits out of the model kit, including that 50 caliber machine gun to keep that aesthetic going. And then I'd found an earring making kit at the hobby store and it was fairly cheap so I figured I'd grab it just in case there was some cool bits in there that I could use. And I ended up taking some of those and a little bit of wire and this tiny little chain and making a grappling hook to attach to the side. I wrapped the chain around another one of those thread spoils and glued it to the mech. And I think it turned out pretty okay. Considering the amount of detail I had put into this thing at this point, I had to take the crafting hat off for a little bit and put on the painting cap because I had a little bit of painting to do on the interior of this thing before I could add the final details and seal the cockpit. So I painted the miniature pilot up real quick and then dry brushed the inside of the cockpit. Even though you wouldn't see it, I wanted to have it there just in case a little bit of the light from the LED gleamed off of some of the parts inside. I put our little pallet in place and sealed everything up nice and tight and moved on to the final details I'd be adding to the mech. I wrapped some EVA foam around the missile pack to cover up the gaps and hide some of the ugly seams. And then I made a little tarp out of some EVA foam and rolled it up and glued it to the top of the torso to cover that ugly seam. And then I made this little equipment rack out of some styrene, some EVA foam, and some wooden stir sticks. And I attached it to the other side of the body. And then I used a little bit more styrene and made this hood which I then used the butane torch and my exacto knife to give it a little bit of battle damage. After that, I grabbed a few more pieces out of the model kit and went all the way around the mech adding in just a little bit more detail here and there to finish everything up and add the final aesthetics to the whole thing.
I turned over to the base one last time where I grabbed some foam core board that you can buy pretty cheap at any dollar store, dollar tree, mighty dollar, anywhere like that. It's usually about a buck or so and you get a pretty fair square of it and you can make easy terrain out of it. It's also impressionable so you can use like a clay sculpting tool or an exacto knife and make marks in it kind of like I did here. I made bricks. I threw on a little bit of broken up sticks and some little gravel and some basalt to add a little bit more fine detail. But before I move on to the painting, I figured it pretty smart to give you a little bit of context about my world. I've decided to call it Gemini, and it's set about 550 years in the future. The short story that I've written for this mech, and what you're about to hear, comes from the perspective of one of the last farmers on the planet before Earth wasn't habitable anymore. Journal entry, April 12th, 2053. I stand among the remnants of what was once the Wells family farm, a desolate testament to the last decade of Earth. The air, thick with the scent of decay and desperation, tells a story of irreversible degradation. These hands, calloused by years of coaxing life from the soil, can no longer find purchase in the poison ground. There was a time when the skies painted promise, and each breeze whispered tales of bountiful harvest. Now the horizon wears scars, etched by our insatiable hunger for power. These fields, once vibrant with life, lie ashen and barren. A reflection of the decay within my own bones. In the distance, the starship Gemini looms colossal ark destined for the stars. I, Sammy Wells, am but a spectator in the final act of Earth's tragic play. I've witnessed the unchecked pollution, the vanishing water streams, the slow suffocation of our once pure air, a narrative unfolding not just in the environment but in the very essence of our humanity. Faces past me, reflecting a mixture of hope and sorrow, boarding the vessel that marks their exodus. I understand their yearning for a new beginning among the stars, yet, for me, this land, scarred and battered, is home. I shall bear witness to its last breath, a silent guardian as the Gemini takes flight. Journal Entry, June 5th, 2053 Fear is a bitter companion, as I watch the horizon darken with ominous silhouettes. Union dropships descend like vultures upon a dying earth. These bring with them colossal walking mechs, towering over the scorched landscape at almost 20 feet tall. The air trembles with their descent, a ballet of destruction. The Union infantry spills out like spilled ink. A relentless tide accompanying these mechanical behemoths. Their mission, whispered among the ruins, is as merciless as the machines themselves. Gather the remnants of sustenance, seize control of the last droplets of water, and leave nothing but ashes in their wake. <laughs> the War Wagon, a monstrous mech patrolling this region cast its ominous shadows over the landscape. Its pilot, known by the call sign Gorilla 3, is a faceless enforcer of the Union's will. They've begun burning homes and executing thousands. Branding dissenters and traitors, fear courses through my veins. A terror not just for my safety, but the fragile existence of my family. Tonight, I locked eyes with the war wagon from the shadows. 
my heart pounding in sync with the relentless footsteps that shake the earth. The air is thick with the stench of burning dreams and the metallic taste of imminent doom. My hands that once brought life now tremble with an unsettling awareness. Journal Entry, October 18th, 2053. The earth trembles beneath the weight of an ominous exchange. Nuclear warheads lighting the skies in a cataclysmic dance of destruction. A deafening silence follows, broken only by the echoes of a dying world. Journal Entry December 19th, 2053 As my hands falter, I commit these words to paper. A testament to the atrocities of the Union and humanity within itself. The agony of a dying planet and the indomitable spirit of humanity. In my final moments, I entrust this journal to my daughter, Emma, who shuttles leaving for Gemini tomorrow. She is now the bearer of Earth's echoes among the stars. Now, as she reads my words in the cosmic embrace of the Gemini, may she carry with her the story of a farmer who tended to the last crops that witnessed to the unraveling of Earth's tapestry. A legacy woven in the ashes of stardust. A reminder that even in the face of despair, the human spirit can endure. Signing off, Samuel Wells. I'd like to thank everyone that's stuck around with me this long for watching. If you haven't yet, consider subscribing. I'll be adding more to this world and building more dioramas in the future. Be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment, and tell me what you think about the whole process. Share it to one of your friends. And we'll see y'all on the other end of the trail. Don't forget to stick around for the glamour shots.